Next on Max TV, we preview Darchini and Arce, and we go through news and notes. Coming up on the next round. And welcome to the next round. Steve Kim joined by Gabriel Montoy, a special luxury box edition of the show. We go through everything in the game of boxing. Round number one, there's a super flyweight showdown at the Anaheim Pond on Showtime with the WBC, WBA, and IBF belts. Vic Darchinian takes on Jorge Arce and kicking off this telecast, lightweights in actions. Kid Diamond takes on Antonio DeMarco in a crossroads matchup. Darchinian Arce, I tell you what, I think this is going to be exciting. I think it's going to be a fun fight. But I get the sense one guy is going this way and the other guy is going that way. I think we can guess which one is which. Yeah, Darchinian is definitely beginning to hit his peak while Arce is, is those miles are starting to show. He's starting to slow down a little bit. I say Darchinian takes him out in about eight. Arce's going to have his moments. He's got that power. He's got durability. He does cut, uh, and I think that's going to be a major factor. But I just don't think he has enough strength, uh, enough everything to, to keep Darchinian off of him. Uh, Gabriel once again laying his cards right on the table. Uh, I pretty much agree with you. Here's the thing about 2008. Vic Darchinian was thought to be a question mark after that huge knockout loss to Nonito Donaire. What I found interesting is if there's ever a knockout loss that has benefited a fighter, that made him respectful of the game and his opponents, it has to be Vic Darchinian. In 2008, I thought he was horrifically overlooked in Fight of the Year honors. There's a guy that won belts against Dmitry Kirilov and absolutely dominated Christian Mahares, who many people, including myself, had in the top 10 pound for pound. The thing that worries me about Arce, there's a lot of miles on that register. Also, he gets hit a lot. And against B and C level competition the last two, three years, he has been touched up by a lot of leather. I get the sense it's going to be a fun fight, but I like the younger, stronger, fresher guy, and I think that is Vic Darchinian. Well, yeah, if you look at uh, Mahadas, he's, he's kind of a, a, a speedier version of your typical Mexican uh, boxer. And Arce got worked over by him by over 12 rounds. Now then you, you look at Darchinian, who you really can't prepare for because he fights unlike any fighter on the planet with his bizarre crab-like style. Um, and then you add in his speed, his craftiness, his, his amateur background, and his overall intelligence and that power. And I, I just don't see how Arce can, can keep him off of it. Uh, I think one big factor is elusiveness. And the one thing about Darchinian, even though he's a big banger and is an aggressive fighter, you talked about that interesting crab style. It's almost like a cobra. He strikes real stealthily. But the thing is, he's a very elusive fighter. And the one thing that I think really offset Christian Maharis in their fight in November, Christian Maharis, for all his tools, speed, and quickness, could not find Vic Darchinian. He was a very, very difficult target to reach. And one guy gets touched up a lot. Jorge Arce is a blood and guts warrior. And unlike, let's say, a Bernard Hopkins who could turn back the clock against a young, hungry opponent, he's a guy that depends on a lot of blunt force and being able to touch you. But there's a price to pay. So I think Vic Darchinian, once again, Prove that he is the world's best 115 pounder. Absolutely, he was. He was my uh, fighter of the year, Vic Darchinian. Um, that knockout loss, going back to that point, was the best thing that ever happened to him. Uh, in the fights leading up to it, he began to rely on his power. His head movement kind of disappeared, and that defense disappeared as he let opponents come in, take their shots on him, so that he could land his thunder. Um, now he's gone back to basics. He's gone back to his uh, to polishing up that style, and yeah, his defense has tightened up tremendously. You know, one thing I like about Vic Darchinian is that he takes every fight so personal and he uses the words demolish this is personal I mean this is a salty little bastard Vic Darchinian every single fight is a passion play with him and he takes it very very personal and you get the sense there's a lot of personal animus Arce is a playful sort you get the sense there's a shtick but like I said about Vic Darchinian he's a mean little guy and I think he wants to absolutely maul Jorge Arce very good fight as a Bone Thugs and Harmony once said we'll see you at the crossroads well this is a crossroad battle between yeah. two lightweights I think that makes for some pretty good TV. Kid Diamond is an up and down fighter. He's had problems with discipline, taking on a very good young television fighter in Antonio DeMarco. I like this fight. I think the leather's going to fly. Yeah, I, I, we're going to find out if he's just a television fighter who's all action or if he's, he's got world class stuff. Uh, Kid Diamond, everybody thought he was going to be the next Kostya Zhu. It didn't turn out that way and said he kind of turned into a, a kind of plodding, no head movement, having one dimensional type fighter. He does have a lot of power. He does have an amateur background. He's got skills, but there's something lacking, a, a sense of desire, a, a sort of passion. And he's been outboxed. He's been, uh, he hasn't been stopped yet, but uh, what is it, was against? Uh, Miguel Huerta. I yeah. thought won eight or nine rounds and also knocked him down. As Dick Vital would say, this guy's been more up and down than the Dow Jones. You have to think at this stage of his career in life, discipline has to set in because if he does not beat DeMarco, Kid Diamond becomes basically an ESPN two-level fighter, not making a lot of money. 
I will go here with the experience. I think Kid Diamond comes to fight. I have no way of knowing it. It's just a hunch. I think it's a very good fight. I think he's more battle-tested. I think DeMarco has a future, but I like the fact that Kid Diamond is a hard veteran, and when he actually trains and puts his mind to it, I do believe he's a top 10, 135-pounder. I like Kid Diamond by late knockout. I, I can't bet on that because I haven't seen Kid Diamond show up like that two fights in a row in a long time. So I'm going to go uh, a 12-round decision uh, for DeMarco. Ooh. But he's, but he's going to be upset tested. Upset special. I like that. The upset special. He's going to get tested in every facet of his game, but he's going to come out a better fighter for it. All right. Well, that's round one of the next round. That is on Showtime this Saturday night from that pond in Anaheim. We come back. We wrap it up with news and notes. And moving on with the next round, we wrap it up with news and notes. We go to the fight review this past Friday night in uh, Canada for the IBF Junior Welterweight title. Juan Urango wins the belt with a clear-cut 12-round decision over Herman Ngozu. Your scores: 118-108, 120-106, 116-110. The and then Saturday, Jalisco, Mexico, Marco Antonio Barrera with a DQ in three rounds over Fredos Rojas. And then featherweight elimination bout in the IBF, Jorge Solis. TKO and five over Monty Meza Clay. Uh, last week we had a little bit of a disagreement here. Here's the thing: I think Ngozu is a solid guy in certain ways, but I don't think he's elite. I do think for all his flaws, Juan Urengo can do one thing: he can bang to the body. And I thought physically he dominated this fight. Oh, absolutely. You know, my problem with him going into the fight was that he was a one punch and done kind of fighter. It turns out in this fight, one punch at a time was all he needed. He landed those two knock, uh, scored those two knockdowns in the third, and the tenor of the fight just changed absolutely. Yeah, I don't think Ngozu had the arsenal to keep Urengo off him, and, and Urengo no. is still very frustrating in the sense that he certainly looks the part. He's built like Tarzan, yet he jabs like Jane. In other words, he doesn't. And I think to me that's going to be his one flaw. He's he's a live dog in a lot of fights. He certainly has the puncher's chance. The problem is with his offensive output, he puts it in layaway. Yeah. And, and that's going to be a problem for him at the highest levels. Is he going to be able to be consistent enough with the jab and to be active enough to win a lot of close rounds? I get the sense Urango is really going to be a tease. Well, when you get outboxed by Ricky Hatton, I mean, that, that kind of says it all. He didn't get out hustled. He didn't get out muscled. He just got outboxed by him. The guy's got to add a jab to his game, which will set up the combinations that are clearly there. But he comes in face first. He takes a few shots that he shouldn't have to. If he just doubled and tripled the jab or even singled it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for full disclosure, we did not see this. We only got reports. Uh, Marco Antonio Barrero was cut against Fredos Rojas, DQ and three. He gets the win. Couple of things. Uh, his fight against Amir Khan, as we speak, is in question. That's a pretty bad cut he suffered. This is why a lot of television contracts dissuade fighters from fighting within 60 to 90 days of a scheduled bout. And the thing that gets me is Marco Antonio Barrera is not a green fighter. This is certainly a fighter with a lot of experience, won numerous world titles, he knows how to fight, and the original opponent dropped out. My point is, why is Marco Antonio Barrera at this stage of his life, if a guy drops out, Fighting a guy who had lost seven out of his last eight fights, it almost made no sense. The other question is, what was he doing in the third round with him? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you put a fight like Amir Khan, which has already sold something like 15,000 seats, you put that fight in jeopardy fighting a virtual unknown, and a guy that, that kind of took you a few rounds and then intentionally headbutts you for a cut, it just made absolutely no sense to me. Yeah, it was almost like he was fighting Coco Beware instead of Freitas Rojas. But here's the funny thing about uh, Marco Antonio Bra. I think the reason why he was so insistent on taking this fight is I actually got to see his last fight in China against Sammy Ventura, and I like Barrera, and I think he could beat Amir Khan if he has a good night. But I have to be honest, he looked like a fat, pudgy old man. I think in his own mind, he needed to go through another training camp and perhaps knock off some of the ring rust. Well, here's the problem. Rust now, now may turn into rest. He may not be fighting Amir Khan. More details as they come. Moving on with the fight preview. Friday Night Fights, Chris Henry takes on Yusef Mack in a battle of light heavyweights. TV Azteca is the premiere of this series with top rank. Jesus Soto Carras takes on Carson Jones. And then on Showbox, Andre Ward takes on Henry Buchanan. And Saturday in Germany, for the WBA heavyweight title, Ruslan Shagayev takes on Carl Drummond. Special, special programming reminder to come in the upcoming minutes. Uh, let's take a look at this fight. Chris Henry, I thought, made a lot of strides against Adrian Diakon, who's an unknown guy to Houston. I thought he gave the shark hell. I think Chris Henry could be a legitimate 
top 10 light heavyweight. I, I think this is a big fight for him. It, it's going to say a lot about where he's going to go. Yusef Mack, you know, he's a Philly fighter. He's, he's got the skills. He's got some good defense. But he fades late, and he can be knocked out. You know, uh, uh, Chris Henry has only been decisioned. I think that's going to be the difference with these guys. It's going to be a second-half fight, and I look for Henry to, to finish it out. Uh, I think Chris Henry, that experience in Romania where he gave everything to the shark, went tooth and nail, lost, I think, by maybe two or three points. I think that is the type of loss every young fighter needs Absolutely. before really ascending into the big time level. Jesus Soto Cross, a stable mate of Antonio Margarito. Uh, there's some issues now. Uh, Javier Capetillo and Margarito have been suspended, so now he needs a new trainer. But I like Soto Cross. This is a guy in the last year or so. I think it's really become an improved prize fighter. Yeah, he's absolutely coming into his own. He's, he's got all around skills and, and he's got good power. It's going to be a big question who's going to be in his corner. And when, in a fight like of this magnitude, being on TV, we'll see what that what that does to him. Yeah, and I have a feeling Carson Jones, no matter who's wrapping Soto Cross's hands, they'll be watching him like an absolute <laughs> hawk. Uh, Andre Ward against Henry Buchanan. I know a lot of people are wondering when is. Andre Ward going to step up. On one respect, I do agree. I mean, he is now four or five years into his pro career. He's had a lot of television experience. But at the same time, Gabe, he's only 24 years old. The other side of me says, what in the hell is the rush? Yeah, there's no rush at all. I mean, I think they're moving him along maybe a little slower than I would like, but they're giving him the kind of fights that, that build a, a good young champion. Buchanan is, is a perfect opponent for him right now because he's not an opponent. He's a guy that's hungry himself, and he's going to test Ward. He is going to test Ward, I don't think physically, but style-wise, I think he's very, very awkward, very difficult. One thing I did like about Ward, seeing him out there live in the Cayman Islands against Jerson Ravella, who was thought to provide a little bit of danger. Uh, I think one thing that Andre Ward took some time in is adjusting to being a professional prize fighter. Mm -hmm. Had some early issues with the chin, but I think physically he has matured, and I think he is turning into a very good professional prize fighter. He looks more and more comfortable as the fights go on. I think in the year or so, he will be a player at 168 pounds. He's also turning into one of the more versatile fighters. Yeah. He's really comfortable moving from southpaw and back. A, a big part of his philosophy is, is kind of having no style, uh, having a, a fluidity to deal with whatever an opponent brings to him. And it's not just lip service. It's not just a good interview. He actually, you can see it in the fights, and it's growing more and more with each fight. Uh, also, this heavyweight title by Ruslan Shagayev, Carl Drummond, if you cannot get it on pay-per-view through your cable provider, guess what, folks? You can get it on Max Boxing, so log on and get all the details for Shagayev against Carl Drummond. Uh, Carl Drummond has a very big record, but I think he's very, very unproven. Not a lot of names that are very, very recognizable. I think there's Concrete Kelvin Davis, and I also think there's Cedric Big Buck Field. He's also 33 years old, which really tells me, has he had the type of activity that he has needed, and has his people have the type of confidence to move him up quickly? I've been on record. I think Shagayev is the second or third best heavyweight in the world. I think he's right up there with the Klitschko brothers, if not a little bit behind. Uh, I expect Shagayev to take care of business against Drummond. I do too. I, I'm, the only thing I'm really curious about is, is one, uh, what the, the layoff has done to him, and two, what the effects of his injury to his Achilles heel will, will have on him. Other than that, I mean, he's, he's one of the most well-schooled heavyweights out there. He can move, he's a southpaw, he's got good combinations and excellent power. I, I look for him to just basically get back into the swing of things around six, seven, or eight and finish it out. And once again, this Saturday, pay-per-view, we can get it online right here on maxboxing.com. Uh, wrapping it up here with some tidbits, a uh, big story out of California, Antonio Margarito and Javier Capetillo have had their licenses temporarily suspended by the California State Athletic Commission. And then Edwin Valero has signed a promotional pact with Top Rank. And then on March 28th, this is a tentative fight, Jermaine Taylor against Alan Green on Showtime, although there are some late-breaking news on that. Here's the thing about Margarito and Javier Capetillo. I, I think people are drawing some conclusions. And what I've said to everybody, let's have due process. None of us knows what's going on with the commission. Let them investigate the contents of those hand wraps. They're going to have a hearing on February 10th. They have both been asked to appear. Let the, let the legal system kind of kick into place. But just because he's on suspension, let's not draw any conclusions. I've been told this is basically an administrative move that they had to make. I, I totally agree. I mean, right now, if you read five different articles, you're getting five different stories of what was in the gloves, who saw them, what fell out, how it all went down. Let's just wait till the 10th. Let's hear all the actual evidence and all the testimony, and we'll go from there. And, and I would add another thing. Everybody's starting to question the rest of his career. Well, he was only caught in this fight. He, the, he only had an incident in this fight. Let's leave the Cotto fight alone. Let's leave all the other fights alone and deal with the fight where we have evidence of, of or alleged evidence of, of some misdoing. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to read a story pretty soon here where he had a horseshoe in one glove and a hand grenade in another. Also, Keith Kaiser, the Nevada State Athletic Commission, uh, for that Cotto fight said there was absolutely no suspicion. 
And Nevada and states like New Jersey where he fought last year, these are big time commissions. These are not podunk Iowa where you have a bunch of rubes that don't know what they're doing. Um, so let's just put it like that, but let the legal process and let this man have due process. Now, if they're found guilty, then you throw the book at them, and absolutely. I think that's absolutely fair. Uh, Jermaine Taylor may be taking on Alan Green. I think that's a very good fight. I got a phone call today that says that perhaps Carl Frock, the WBC champion, he wants in. So there's also a very good chance sometime in mid-April we might have a doubleheader on the network of Jermaine Taylor against Carl Frock for the WBC title. And maybe, now this is a good step up about Alan Green against Andre Ward. I like that card. I like that card a lot. I mean, all, all those fights are, are kind of crossroads bouts. You yes. Know? I think if, if Green loses to Ward, that's it. He's going to be something of a gatekeeper and not really a, a top 10 contender anymore. And then and Ward will signal that he can hang with the big boys and beat somebody that's got some world-class experience in Alan Green. And then the other fight, Carl Frock versus Jermaine Taylor. I mean, that's just, you can't ask for anything more. Yeah, I think that's a very, very solid doubleheader. And I think Frock provides the perfect test. He's a good, solid fighter, has a major world championship belt, but he's not exactly Mikhail Kessler either. I still no. think Jermaine Taylor, after Jeff Lacey, I think this is the appropriate step for Mr. Bad Intentions. Well, that's it for this week's edition of TNR. On behalf of Gabe Montoya and the rest of Max Boxing, till the next round, goodbye, everybody.